Raceway for round four of the Yamaha Motor Finance Australian Superbike Championship. Very much you want to wear away. Great start from Daniel Fowles in there, who got the real good jump. Water's coming up the inside. Her boss is up and around in the third position as well. Fowles is down. Our race leader is out of the race at Yamaha Motor Finance Corner. There's Brian Starring up the inside. Bogdan has a great second in the middle. Maxwell has gone down. I'll tell you what, he looks like he may have even oh. winded himself as well. Oh, I think he's come in contact with the motorcycle. 105, 986 for Josh Waters. A new lap record for Josh Waters. The first rider this weekend into the 105. Josh Waters will come to the line. He takes his sixth victory. Debut victory for Suzuki X-Star in 2017. Thank you for watching round five of the Yamaha Motor Finance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul Pirelli. I'm your host, Emma Nota Francesco, and once again, one of the faces of ASBK. Thanks for joining us, Steve Martin. Oh, it's great to be here, Em, as it, always. It is great to be here in sunny Morgan Park, Queensland. And it's about this time we can start talking about the championship. As I said, it is round five and things are really firing up. We've got plenty of contenders, plenty of points up for grabs this weekend and lots of tight battles. This stage, though, we've got Troy Herfosh out the front. By 13 points, he leads the way. And that SP2, well, that is unbeatable at the moment. Yeah, it's an exciting time for Honda with that new bike coming on board last time out in Darwin. Um, and with Troy's form at this circuit, they're definitely going to be one of the harder combinations to beat this weekend. Someone has been pretty hard to beat. Well, he hasn't had a win at the moment, but very consistent. Robbie Bugden, they've been calling him the underdog all year long, not the underdog anymore. Yeah, the BC Kawasaki rider. Uh, he's had three or four podiums this year. He's been up there, thereabouts. He's shown lots of form, but I think it's time for him to come out of his shell and perhaps take his first win, especially if he's going to have make his mark on this championship. And looking at third position, Daniel Felzon, things didn't really go as planned after Hinn Valley. He'll be looking to make up those points this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. He's lucky to be on the grid, actually. He had a big crash yesterday in qualifying, uh, but he's out there and he's in one piece. So it's just a matter for him uh, just to see if he can get it to the finish line this weekend. Well, certainly this track, not as physical as Darwin, but it is very, very technical. As you said before, this guy, he won here last year. He absolutely loves this track. It's our championship leader at the moment. Let's take a look around Morgan Park with Troy Herfos. Hi, I'm Troy Herfos from the Crank Radiant Honda team. I'm going to take you guys for a lap around Morgan Park. We're going to start with turn one, the most crucial corner on the track. This corner closed up a hell of a lot, so you've got to lead from the start. So I've exited turn one into turn two, out of turn two we come to turn three, the most difficult corner on the track. It's blind and it has a really late apex because the corner closes up on the exit. So you have to make sure you come in nice and wide and as you exit the corner you can't see where you're going over the hill and what makes it so exciting is the fact that the concrete wall on the inside is on the white line so your shoulder and your head is almost touching if not touching everywhere. Turns four, five and six, and here we are at turn seven, the most crucial corner on the track. The reason being, it's really tight into this turn, but offers a lot of passing opportunity. But if you do, you could lose your drive down the hill. After the long back section, we climb out of turn 10 to the final chicane, turns 11 and 12. It's very important here to get a run out of turn 12, but it's the last passing opportunity on the way to the finish line. Well, this track should certainly make for some very interesting racing this week, and we're going to take a very quick break. Stay tuned.
So here we are at Morgan Park. It's round five, so there's no surprises that everyone is talking about one thing, the championship. Now with plenty of points up for grabs this weekend, some tight battles, and let me tell you, plenty of tension up and down the paddock. Let's hear what our top five had to say. Yeah, I think we just, we just have to put everything that happened last round behind us. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of politics involved, uh, a lot of controversy. I would just go out there, try to get as many points as I can, and uh, continue pursuing the championship as we originally planned. It's motorcycle racing, there's always going to be tension in the pits. None of us riders really enjoy each other's company. Well, I don't enjoy a lot of riders' company at the moment. <laughs> I think it goes vice versa, so yeah, I'm just here to do my job. I'm here to get as many points as I can, and I'm not in motorcycle racing to make friends. It's a shake home to be a pretty exciting end of season, isn't it? Um, after Darwin, taking the championship lead was pretty unexpected for us at, at Honda. It was a pretty straightforward um, incident involving Daniel Fowlson and Kyle Buckley. And, um, and we left the round with the lead and then all of a sudden we were equal on points and then again we're leading in it. So, um, yeah, the right decision was made. It's, it's plain as day really in my eyes and, and everyone else's eyes. So. We're not here to really make friends. Ultimately, the Yamaha pay me to do a job. They pay Troy to do a job. You know, um, I mean, we're here to win, and there's uh, more at stake than to become mates at the end of it. You know, I know I'm capable of winning, but you need to have things go your way and uh, make no mistakes. Unfortunately, we've made mistakes. You know, we're starting to run out of rounds, so it's it's time to make a move. That's for sure. So, yeah, we really need to uh, go up a level this next next few rounds. I've got three rounds to go now. I'm looking at the championship a little bit different. Still having the same uh, approach, whatever happens, happens, but I'm a racer and I'd love to win. So there you have it, a paddock full of friction. Looks like it's game on this weekend. Superbike riders are now on the grid getting ready for Superbike race number one here at Morgan Park and the fifth round of the 2017 Yamaha Motor Finance Australian Superbike Championship and what a sight it is. Tension is really starting to build now as the riders get ready for the start of the first race here at Morgan Park. Corey Turner there, you can see what an impact he's made into the championship but the man everybody is watching, Crew Halliday, set his fault first pole position for the year and he's with Emma. Crew, since the last round you made lots of changes to the bike including the suspension I believe, obviously it paid off. Yeah, it has. You know, uh, the team's worked flawlessly since Darwin. Uh, me and my old man went down for a trip to see uh, Cruise Shoon down there, and uh, you know they got us sorted out. So, uh, you know, we, we are on a little bit different suspension package, um, but we this is mainly we've uh, this weekend settled on engine braking. Uh, you know, Glenn McMahon's really put in over his head, and uh, you know I, I don't really know what I'm doing that much with it, and uh, he's guiding me through it. So, you know, he's been a big help, and I can't say enough of the team. Go get him. Good luck. Thank you. I'm here with Robbie Bugden. Robbie, qualified eighth, but Darwin was pretty good. You're sitting second in the championship right now. Yeah, correct. I think, um, you know, eighth isn't exactly where we wanted to be, but, uh, you know, looking forward that we've, uh, you know, we've been in worse starting positions and we've uh, gave ourselves a chance to win the race. So that's, uh, that's our attitude at the moment. We, uh, we need to get through these first sort of five laps pretty clean and, um, you know, be in the hunt towards the end and, and really dice it out for those sort of last five laps. And uh, I think we had a pretty good race pace with the, uh, you know, the Kawasaki ZX-10 and the, the BC Performance guys have done a uh, done mag magnificent job. So, you know, we, uh, we just need to stay in this and uh, it's going to be those last five laps that uh, that's going to make, make, make the difference. Just here with Daniel Felson and Daniel had a high side yesterday that one of the fastest corners on the track, 206 kilometres you were travelling at. You missed the second qualifying. I guess the first question is, are you OK? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm OK. Yesterday I was a little bit fuzzy and a bit dazed, but uh, we came back earlier this morning. I got a medical clearance and I feel back to my normal self. Uh, a little bit sore, but uh, got to ride with what we've got. And a long night for the boys in the garage. I saw them working till very, very late. They were grabbing anyone they possibly could. Did you get any takers to help you out? Oh, no, not really. We're a competition, so there's not going to be many people helping. But uh, the team did a fantastic job. They built the bike up, but we are on the spare bike today, just, to, just in case we didn't have enough time to test if everything was OK with the other bike. So I'm looking forward to it. I know I'm, I'm confident on this bike, so it should be a good race. Good luck. Thank you very much. Call him the Wayne train, call him the enforcer. He's starting from seventh today on the grid. How are you feeling, Wayne? Yeah, look, you know, I'm feeling okay. I had a good pace in warm up and we were consistent yesterday, sort of throughout on the race tie. So it'd be interesting to see what our strategy everyone else has taken and um, we know what we've got to do. We've just got to try to hit our target number and be consistent and make no mistakes. 
Well, if you take it back to Darwin and look at the starts, your start's going to be important today. Have you been working on that? Yeah, we've worked on some starts, changed the strategy there a bit, so hopefully it's uh, good enough to get us away with the lead, guys, and we can uh, put on a show. I know you're not overly wrapped about getting lots of second places. You've only won once this year, but let's look back to last year because you only had one win and you went on to win the championship. So that must be pretty comforting. That's right. It's a it's a long year, so there's a lot of competitive riders, so the main thing is to take as many points each weekend. So. Um, I'm happy with where we're at this year. Good luck. Thank you. We'll get ready now to head off on the warm-up lap, but a couple of really good points came out of those grid interviews. Wayne Maxwell didn't have the one-lap pace that he would have liked to uh, get a good qualifying position, but he didn't seem too worried about that either. He knows what he's got to do in this race, and that is hit consistent lap times. And one thing about Wayne Maxwell, he can do the consistency thing very well. Crew Halliday scored his first ever pole position and great to see the privateer Yamaha R1 rider up there on the front row of the grid in position number one on bike 65. He's joined on the front row of the grid by reigning champion Troy Herfos, who left the round here last year with a deficit and went on to win the championship. Josh Waters, well, we know how good he was at the last round on board that X-Star Suzuki. Brian Starring will start from the second row of the grid. He'll be joined by Corey Turner and also Daniel Fowles. And watch out for Corey Turner. He has showed unbelievable pace. Wayne Maxwell, as we said, will start out of position number seven. Robbie Bugden out of eight. And Matt Walters, a good qualified performance from him. He'll start out of position number nine. Row four is Bo Beaton. Glenn Allerton, great to see him back as well on board that Yamaha factory machine. He's still suffering from injury, but look out for the three-time champion. Right behind him, Al Phyllis. Then the next row of the grid, row five, we've got Sloan Frost, the Kiwi, Mitch Levy, Troy Gunther, Michael Blair, Ryan Yanko and Adam Senior make up row six with Ashley Fleming on his delectable Aprilia RSV4 round out the field. Why am I sitting right fast, ready to go for race number one? Crew Halliday starting from pole position. And they're away, it's Crew Halliday. Gets a great start, what a jump off the line. For Crew Holiday, but Josh Waters. Look at Waters. He wasn't fast off the line, but the drive down into turn one for the Suzuki was sensational. Troy Herfoss is back to third place, but Waters leads them up through Modal Corner and around through scary fast turn three. Oh, for the first look line. at Falzon. Falzon's already out of the seat there as they head through turn three and down into Pirelli Corner for the first time. They've got to be careful. They don't want to let that number 21 machine get away at the front like it did out at the car. Oh, Falzon shoves it down the inside of Wayne Maxwell. The fireworks have started already ready and Maxwell goes back around the outside of the Caterpillar Yamaha rider to take up the running right on the back tail of uh, Robbie Bugden's BC Performance Kawasaki and uh, Corey Turner has got off to a great start but I was just looking back to through the field he's in sitting in fifth position with Bugden and Maxwell right on his tail. Yeah I reckon that's the highest we've seen that uh, Ducati this uh, year uh, up in the field so that's a great uh, start for the Ducati team. Looked like Bo Beaton got a pretty good start as well on board that race's edge. Panigale, as we said, running the Bridgestone tyres, but it is still Waters that leads from Halliday. Two blue bikes out the front. Allerton has got a pretty good start as well. And remember, he is racing injured this weekend, not so much from the injury that uh, kept him out of the previous rounds. The broken arm from Wakefield Park. He had a crash here in testing and has really injured his shoulder. And uh, that's what's holding him back at the moment. Well, maybe he's even himself up because he's actually working pretty good out there at the moment as Allerton. Good to see him um, just sitting in 11th position at the moment. But uh, look at uh, Waters out front. That bike is pretty smooth at the moment. An 18.5 from a standing start for Josh Waters. That's, uh, that's a pretty impressive lap time. That's uh, almost an old, you know, three or four year old lap record. So, uh, like, pretty much safely safe. We're going to see that lap record tumble very shortly. Yeah, Brian Starring is right onto the back of his teammate, Troy Herfoss, as well. Starring on 67, former World Superbike, uh, World Superstock, and uh, MotoGP rider. Yeah, poor old uh, Wayne. Oh, the Wayne train didn't get the start that he was hoping for, did he? Well, he was right on the back of his teammate, Troy Herfoss, but uh, I think Corey Turner just shoved it up the inside oh. of uh, Brian Starring, and they've both lost a little bit of distance now off, uh, off the back of uh, Troy Herfoss's number one crank protein Honda. Of course, the second round this weekend for the uh, the new Honda uh, CBR 1000 RR SP2. Oh, Maxwell up the inside of Robbie oh. Bugden. They used to do this when they were teammates. Now they ride for completely different teams. There's certainly going to be no holds barred action between those two. He didn't quite get through, though, did Maxwell, but he can see the pack up front uh, start to, you know, get away from him. He needs to do something quickly. And if anything, that probably just fired Robbie Bugden to a whole new level as Josh Waters still leads. 
down into turn one at the start of lap three. Crew Halliday sitting right on his tail. Troy Herfoss is there as well as the top three have just started to get away a fraction. Now from Corey Turner, who's moved uh, from his fifth starting position up into fourth place on board the Desmo Sport Ducati. Brian Starring right behind him. Then it's Maxwell, Bugden, Al Phyllis and Matt Walters sitting in tenth place, having another good ride here this weekend. Right, the old lap record of uh, 1.14.3 is gone. 13.5, the first uh, flying lap of Josh Waters has just smashed the old lap record. Well, we said we thought it was going to go. The, the big question is now, Steve, how many times will the lap record go in this race? We're up to one already, yeah, and it's only the, it's well on the starting now, the second flying lap. Um, look at the lead that those guys, the top three, have got out already. What a brilliant uh, first uh, lap for the top three riders here. Brian Starring uh, back down with Corey Turner there as well in fourth and fifth position at the moment. What's that was a 14-3. 14-3 was the old lap record. One, two, three, four. Four riders actually broke the old lap record on the first flying lap. Yeah. Bit of a gap now for them to the uh, leading trio. Troy Hurth, I'm pretty happy with that at the moment, I think. First time on the new SP2, the new 2017 model at this circuit. They did a test here, but the first time he's raced at it. Um, a lot more electronically advanced than the old bike and a few more um, ho horsepower GGs as well. Well, the other thing is, though, too, that uh, we saw them working hard on the electronic package in Darwin. They probably haven't had to work as hard on the package here this weekend because they learnt so much about it in Darwin as well. When you've got a brand new motorcycle, it's always going to be a lot better at the second meeting than the first. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know what happened to Corey Turner, but he's uh, he's gone back in the pack a little bit now. He's back down to six. So he was in fourth in front of Starring, but uh, he's uh, worked his way back a little bit now. So uh, something happened there with the uh, well, um, Ducati man. Two lap records. Troy Herfoss has just lowered it to a 13-3. <laughs> a 13-3, and he's sitting in third place at the moment. Uh, he closed in onto the back of uh, Crew Halliday's machine. Look at Herfoss. He's looking menacing as he closes up onto the back of the, uh, the iPhone Yamaha yeah. of Crew Halliday. I think his entire conservation mode at the moment. 16 laps around here is a, is a long way, and uh, you can just see by the way he's sitting on the bike, it's looking pretty comfortable uh, in that um, third position at the moment. I don't think he's going to take any risks. I think uh, as long as uh, Josh Waters doesn't break away, you'll see Herfoss uh, taking it pretty easy. The thing is, we do know that Crew Halliday's got a, a Dunlop rear tyre uh, fitted to his bike, which could be better towards the end of the race. That depends on because, uh, we know that the uh, the Pirelli's on the uh, on the Suzuki and Pirelli's on the Honda, but that Dunlop there's a bit of a wild card there for, uh, for Crew Halliday. Brian Starring, Wayne Maxwell, Corey Turner. Corey Turner's now got uh, fellow Queenslander Robbie Bugden right on his tail as well as our early championship leader Daniel Fowles on who's slipped back to second place in the championship. But uh, yeah, a very, very small lead. Oh! Herfoss has gone down. That's going to be his first DNF for, uh, well, in uh, living memory in the Superbike class in ASBK. That is going to blow the championship wide apart. Can he get the bike going and get back handlebar's on track? Handlebar's broken. The handlebar's, no, handlebar's broken. broken. That's the end of Troy Herfoss's uh, claim in that, race mate. number one. Let's, but let's just see what happens. He's gone in. He's tipped in. He's lost the front early in the corner into YMI and uh, not much you can do there. Handlebar... Hits the dirt, snaps off. He's perfectly fine. If that handlebar didn't break off, he could have got up and salvaged some points. But uh, just for that, uh, hitting the curve back to front, but uh, he will not be able to rejoin the race. Unfortunately, this race is all over for Troy Herfoss. We'll be back into the pits and uh, the Team Honda guys will uh, have a look at the damage there, but it didn't look like there was too much damage. What we do need to do is uh, keep an eye on the gap now from that uh, leading couple uh, back to Brian Starring in third position. The gap at the moment is 2.4 seconds, so we'll monitor that to see if those boys can pull that gap back. Corey Turner, though, doing a great job, still hanging in there in the background. Um, he's had a bit of a, a rough ride at the moment. He's been forward and back in the pack a bit. Wayne Maxwell, though, is on a charge, and he's not going to do anything silly like he did in Darwin where he lost the front. I think he's going to methodically work his way through this time. He knows it's a long way around this track, but look oh. at Corey Turner. Well, Corey Turner's uh, looking increasingly desperate to try and find his way past Wayne Maxwell there. See how he tries to put the move on, loses a little bit of distance, has to find his way back again. Look at Brian Starring's uh, Honda CBR moving around. The crank protein Honda was uh, moving around there. The front wheel wasn't even on the ground as uh, Starring was trying to manhandle it with his body weight uh, as he went down towards high-tech batteries. 
corner. He comes Maxwell up the inside. Wayne Maxwell. <laughs> oh, that's a difficult move. But that's a typical there. Wayne Maxwell maneuver, isn't it? Does yeah. it? Uh, does it look so easy? Just gets in there, and you can see as they come through there, Maxwell actually uses far less lean angle. And well, we're talking about that's what we were looking at in Darwin, Steve. I actually yeah. asked his mechanic, and he said yes. The data actually backs that up as well. He uses less lean angle, and he also uses uh, one set of knee sliders in uh, Warren Monson reckons about four years. Yeah, what what he does is he, he slides it in front and rear, uh, up the inside on a higher angle. That gives him the turn, um, and uh, he just did that manoeuvre beautifully. That's a great uh, corner to make an overtake for the one. The gap was 2.4, it's 2.9, but let's just see how it comes down now. Corey Turner's also passed Brian Starring and uh, trying to go with Maxwell as well as they make their way down towards the uh, YMI corner now. Very bumpy through this uh, area of the track. One thing I do know is that uh, there's a couple of different tyre choices for the Pirelli guys uh, this weekend. There's the SC0, which is a soft, which probably will make the distance. And then there's the harder one, the Phillip Island tyre, uh, that I know Corey Turner's got on. He prefers it over the softer tyre, so it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I don't know what uh, tyre Maxwell chose, but if he chose the SC0, it could turn around uh, towards the end of the, the race here today, and Corey Turner could get stronger. Wayne Maxwell is starting to close the gap down. It is down to 1.4 seconds as they came through intermediate number two. I reckon it might even be closer as they come across the line now. Yeah. Waters, Crew Halliday, Wayne Maxwell, 1.1 seconds. He's taken 0.3 of a second out of the last sector in the, in the race. So uh, Maxwell coming on strong on the 11th of 16 laps. So he's got uh, five and a half laps to go, Wayne Maxwell. And the pace that he is on at the moment, he was the he's only there. rider in the field that was in the 13s on the last lap. The thing is, Crew Halliday will know he's coming. But uh, Josh Waters, not necessarily will. Just have, oh, oh there's smoke. Smoke coming out of Brian Starring's machine. But oh. also have a look, too, at the, uh, the left-hand side of Corey Turner's tyre, it actually looked like it was uh, starting to uh, show visible signs of wear speed. Well, we'll have a look at that, but that uh, smoke, not a good sign from the, from the Crank Protein Honda. Hopefully that's just a little bit of overrun. The marshals will be on top of it anyway. They'll have a look. And he's through! Crew is through! Crew Halliday into the lead, driving up from Suzuki Corner, up through Yamaha. Now it is Crew Halliday. Oh, how fast did he push that front end into there? He was probably fractionally offline. I think that was the uh, the speed with which he'd gone into that corner because I think he knows Wayne Maxwell is coming. <laughs> Maxwell is up the inside of Waters now and up into second place. So the two Yamaha riders, one privateer, one factory, lead this race on lap 12 of 16. So Wayne Maxwell doesn't even need to worry about his start. I don't know what he's worried about. He's absolutely flying out there today. Another 13-6 for Wayne Maxwell. No wonder that Crew Halliday thought, you know what, I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to get a move on. Because now he's got some serious competition sitting in the rear wheel. Well, and how many laps from that is Maxwell now in the 13s? In fact, Glenn Allerton's actually slipped back to a 16 on that last lap. I'd say his uh, shoulder injury is starting to uh, really take a toll now. Absolutely. I mean, if Allerton finishes this race, it's a great testament to him, you know, he just needs to get this race meeting under his belt um, and then come out strong in a couple of weeks' time at uh, Sydney Motorsport Park. Unfortunately, Matt Walters is also out of the race. He's retired back into the, uh, the pits on board the uh, Walters Motorcycles Kawasaki Connection machine. But look at Maxwell. He's just... He's like a hunter stalking his prey. Yeah, I need, we need to keep it time. I want to see what the lap time is now that Crew Halliday does. Uh, he was in the 14s. He needs to get back into the 13s, otherwise he's going to be eaten up. Well, Wayne Maxwell is sitting right behind Crew Halliday now as they come down into turn one. This area's caught a few riders out of the track. Oh, Crew Halliday, he's off the circuit. Has he got back on safely? He has. Wayne Maxwell has gone past into the lead. Crew Halliday has lost all of his drive. And I think Josh Waters may have been compromised somewhat there as well. And look at Corey Turner. He's coming around the outside of Josh Waters. In fact, he's gone past Waters as they come down into Pirelli corner, turn four. He's now got his eyes set firmly on Crew Halliday. He saw Crew had that moment not too long ago, and he'll be trying to line him up and go past. He does. He does go past down into YMI corner now and sets his sights on Wayne Maxwell. Wow, what a couple of chorus for Corey Turner in his debut ride on board that Desmo Sport Ducati. Let's have a replay now of this incident involving Crew Halliday. He was so lucky to not go way off the circuit there, although he did compromise his drive. And you can see Josh Waters had to take evasive action. 
And that's what allowed Corey Turner to get past and then set up this passing manoeuvre on Crew Halliday to move into second place. And what a debut it's been for the young man from Queensland. You can see him there sitting in second place on the Desmo Sports Ducati as they come round to complete lap 14 and start the penultimate lap. Let's quickly get down to the pits and uh, Luke's with Brian Starring. Guys, I'm here with Brian in the pits. Mate, what's happened? Uh, just a small mechanical. Yeah, it's a bad time, but um, yeah, look, just a, a small mechanical, that's all. How was the race going up until that point? Uh, beforehand, it was going okay. I was sort of settling in in the first half, and then uh, I started having a few dramas there, and I started losing my confidence a bit, and in the end, it was uh, best, best I come in. So anyway, look, my my CBR 1000 SP2 is, is actually awesome. <laughs> And, I, you know, I think we're trying to show everything we had there at the start of the race, but unfortunately we couldn't bring it home today. But the bike's unreal, and uh, my team's great, and I can't wait to smack it in the next one. Better luck in race two, mate. Yeah, whatever that problem was for Brian Starring, uh, he had to pit, so um, let's hope that the boys can get that bike uh, ready. They've only got one of the new SP2s each. What a brilliant ride, though, from the man out front. The man that's managed the race, Wayne Maxwell, as he goes through the chicane for the final time and up towards the finish line. Maxwell's going to take this one out. It's a great ride through the pack from Wayne Maxwell and Team Yamaha. They deserve that one. Well, he said on the grid it was all about hitting targets. The target that he hit was every race that he was improving, and he eventually took the race win by 0.931 of a second over Corey Turner. Congratulations to Wayne Maxwell. I reckon underneath that tinted visor on board that shark helmet, there is a massive, massive smile for the, uh, the Yamaha team rider and he bounces back from uh, well a couple of disappointing rounds by his uh, by his lofty standards yeah he's been helped out though uh, can't wait to see the new championship points uh, when they're added up um, because uh, with the uh, Herfoss going out that's definitely going to help Wayne Maxwell uh, move towards the front of the pack confirmation of your results from Yamaha Motorcycle Insurance Superbike race number one and Wayne Maxwell does take the win by 0.931 of a second over Corey Turner. Crew Halliday rounds out the podium on another Yamaha R1. Josh Waters on board the Suzuki, Daniel Fowles and Robbie Bugden, Al Phillips, Bo Beaton, Glenn Allerton and Michael Blair round out the top ten. You know, massive thanks to Warren, Plummy, everyone at Team Yamaha like the bike, you know, we had a bit of a talk this morning after warm up and um, yeah, the bike's been, you know, really good. It's good over long run. We didn't have that one lap pace that normally I have. And, um, you know, I woke up this morning at three o'clock, couldn't sleep. And, um, you know, I just running through my head and then uh, to come out and, you know, reward the boys with that after such a disappointing round in Darwin and a disappointing day yesterday, uh, there's no better way. I can't thank the whole crew for coming out. Family, friends, support me. Um, yeah, the boys did a great job. The Desmo Sports Ducati is working really well. Um, we had a few big moments at the start. I think that's what kind of dropped us off that front group. Um, but yeah, I just uh, tagged on the back of Wayne because I knew he was catching the front guys. And uh, yeah, he pulled me up to the front guys and a couple other mistakes. But yeah, really, I'm just over the moon. I'm stoked. I thought it was going to just be me, Josh, and Troy. Uh, you know, when I look back and see there was a bit of a gap. But then I kept saying, uh, went from 2.4 to 2 to 1.4. I look back and I seen Wayne and Corey there and I was like, we're in a bit of trouble here if they're coming that quick. So, uh, no, I, I made a mistake in turn one, uh, exiting, uh, entering turn two, which was probably co co cost me a fair bit of time. Corey got past me then, and no, uh, happy with that. Happy with the team to get him a first uh, podium for this year, and uh, see what we can do in race two. The action is only just getting started here at Morgan Park. Join us on the other side of this break for Motul Supersport Race One. It's fair to say that the 600 class has been forgotten about in the last decade. A lot of the technology has gone on to the bigger thousands while these smaller 600cc machines have remained the same. Yamaha though have bucked the trend and have released a brand new R6 onto the market with a lot of the technology that you would see on the bigger bikes brought into this smaller class. The first thing you notice about the new R6 is its all new look. But it's not just the looks, that look also makes it 8% more aerodynamic. It's been brought into the 21st century as well with its electronic package. It's got traction control and ABS now, something it didn't have in the past. To give it that race a feel though, the thing that I like the most is the quick shifter. It's got an automatic quick shifter on this bike and it makes it a real buzz to ride. With over 50% of the Supersport field riding R6s, it only made sense for Yamaha and the YRD development team 
to build a race kit for the new bike and we got to ride it. Have a look at this. I noticed when I got on board was how powerful this thing is. It might only be a 600, but boy, does it scream. It's a real cool feeling to be able to change gears without the clutch, something that really makes this bike a joy to ride. The other thing I noticed compared to the old R6, which I've ridden in the past, is the way that when you get in tucked in behind the screen on this bike, the wind really goes over the top of you. It gives you a really nice tucked in feeling. It makes you feel like you're part of the bike. After having ridden the new bike out on track, I can attest that all the new modifications that Yamaha have made have really brought this bike into the 21st century. And I know that the guys that ride these things on the road and the track are gonna have a big smile on their faces. Welcome back to Morgan Park and round five of the 2017 Yamaha Motor Finance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul Pirelli and we are getting ready for Supersport race number one. It has been a great mix this year of experienced campaigners and young guns and there is the very impressive Sam Condon. A great uh, rookie effort from him this year. But no one's had more propositions than Mark Chiodo and he's down with Emma on the grid. Thank you very much, Phil Harlem. Mark Chiodo joins me and Mark, just where you want to be. This is your third pole position in five rounds, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the race and um, just see where we end up. I mean, it's going to be hard physical here. And yeah, um, starting from first is good. I've heard that you've made some uh, changes to your starting technique. Can you take us through that? Uh, yeah, I've changed it to what everyone uses. Um, after Darwin, I was ending up six from first, every first corner. So um, yeah, I've changed that to just the normal way and hopefully it pays off. Go get him. Ted Collins, Next Gen Motorsport, starting second on the grid, mate. Darwin was pretty good to you. Yeah, no, Darwin was a really good round. You know, we took the round win, we got the lap record, so uh, definitely a good round for us. Um, qualifying went really well for us yesterday. We were only were thousandths of a second off pole position, so really doesn't get any closer than that. And I know I've got a good race pace, so I'm going to get out there today and give it my best shot. Now, the tracks are quite physically different, aren't they? Like, what's most challenging about Morgan Park here? Yeah, Morgan Park's a lot a lot tighter of a track than Darwin was. Darwin's quite open and flowy, so yeah, it takes, takes a different bike set up, different mentality going into the race here, but no, I'm really looking forward to it and I feel like we've got a good chance. Starts crucial, mate. Best of luck. Thank you. Tom, I have to say, a lot of the guys ahead of you on the grid at the moment, they've had a lot more experience than you. You got, to, I've got to give my hat off to you. You've had a great season so far. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we've kind of we haven't been too bad um, you know in terms of learning the bike and stuff um, my team's obviously run riders on this bike before and and that obviously plays out in in my racing so um, it's I'm really grateful for that but um, yeah the guys in front of me are, are all good riders and it's, it's gonna be a tough race but I don't see any reason why we can't you know be there or thereabouts and and try and challenge for a win so hopefully it goes all right good luck we're just getting kicked off to the group boys so it's back up to you Phil Harlem Steve Martin Thanks very much, Emma. Yes, uh, we, as we said, some very fast young men in the super sport category this year. Ted Collins, of course, is our championship leader. He hasn't mentioned it much, but I know he's coming into this round with a shoulder injury, just like Glenn Allerton suffered a massive uh, shoulder injury at the recent test here. And uh, his performance is even more commendable when you factor in that injury. But as they head off on their warm-up lap here at a very sunny Morgan Park, let's have a quick look at the grid. Mark Yedo, as we said, three pole positions from five rounds. He'll start there again. Ted Collins and Chris Quinn, the most experienced man in the field, join him on the front row of the grid. Tom Taparis, Nick Limington and Sam Muldoon will be on row two with Sam Condon, Mason Coote and Cambridge Olivier rounding out row three. Row four, Jordan Carlson, the local man, Reese Belling and Aidan Hayes on board the Kawasaki ZX6R for the second round. Now, Lincoln Gilding, former Australian Moto3 champion, will head up row five with Brian Horton, the reigning champion, along with Mick Hefferon, the Northern Territorian. Steph Redman, Ryan Sellen, and Patrick Lee rounds out row six in this massive super sport field. Devices are coming down now, and we are getting ready for a start in Moto Super Sport, race number one. Keep an eye on the start of Marcus Kyoto, and he's off. Great start there from Mark Kyoto. Looked like he got the triumph off the line well, but where is Ted Collins? That Suzuki GSXR is notoriously quick off the line, and I think he's into the lead. 
Chiato's only gone back to third by his recent starts. That's actually a really good result there for uh, for Marchiato. And Tom Taparis on board bike number seven is up into second place. Yeah, good start by Tom Taparis. He was keen to get uh, get moving, and he did in second position at the moment. Ted Collins, the man on his GS6R, takes the lead at the moment as they head down the hill into Pirelli Corner. Through this little tight section here, and then into the YMI Yamaha Motor Insurance Corner, which is this corner right here, right-hander up the hill. Yeah, Quinn and Muldoon had a little bit of a dispute there over the uh, position in the corner. Nick Limington was able to take full advantage of that, and he's now moved up into uh, fifth position as uh, Quinn leads the rest of the pack through. But the top three, only half a lap into this race, have managed to uh, get away. I think that was because uh, Quinn and uh, Sam Muldoon, as they came together, they actually slowed their pace down. And look at that tight group that's uh, bunched up there with uh, Sam Condon in there as well on board bike number 64, doing a great job right on the back of Mason Scoot. Has, uh, on the arc electrical machine. Oh, you can just see how bumpy this circuit is, can't you? The, when they're heading down that back straight there, the bikes are moving around all over the place as they come through the chicane, the Yamaha chicane, and up for, for the first lap. Look at Ted Collins. The lead he's got already, it's uh, just out to 0 0.7 of a second. That's a great first lap by Ted. And we saw how confident he was earlier on. Different lines there from uh, the two boys behind him, number seven and number 12, Mark Yoda. You can see Mark Yato's, uh, style there. He's got his, he's almost got his chin on the ground as they come round past the wall there at uh, Morgan Park. You can see Tom Taparis' bike pattering away on the brakes down into Pirelli Corner there just, uh, as the bike rides over the bumps. Tom Taparis looking very, very physical on the bike this weekend and uh, looking like he's riding at more of a Superbike sort of style than uh, a normal 600 Supersport style. There's Chris Quinn on board bike number 82. He's just starting to get away a little bit from uh, Nick Limington on the race centre uh, Yamaha R6, bike number 27. It's going to be interesting, interesting to see what Nick can do. Of course, Nick's uh, a fairly young rider with the experience of uh, Chris Quinn in front of him. He can probably learn a lot off him. The thing that impresses me, though, Mark Chiodo, down and out in the morning warm-up, sits in third position. That's the smartest place for him to be right now. He needs to sit there. He needs to, like, regroup. These are the first couple of laps he's done since he's been off that bike. Um, if he can just, like, settle himself down later on in this race, I think he could be one to watch. Yeah, and uh, he's doing great up there just hanging on to the back of Tom Taparis. So they come across the start finish line. I think Collins may have just eked out a fraction more of a now. It's gone down in fact. It's back down to a 0.4 of a second because Tom Taparis was the fastest man on track on that last lap with a 116.1, a 16.3 for Ted Collins and a 16.1 as well for, uh, for Mark Chiodo. So uh, Chiodo and uh, Taparis starting to close in now on Ted Collins and you can see how much closer they are as they come down the hill into the Pirelli corner. Yeah, Taparis there closing up uh, under brakes and Pirelli and perhaps even looking for, to line his uh, way up. M maybe not for this lap, but uh, he's in a good position now to um, try and find out where the weak points there are of uh, Ted Collins, if there are any. Just looking at that run through Pirelli and down the Yamaha Motor Insurance corner, it's a, a big sweeping corner in between those two. Ted Collins, to me, looks to be carrying more corner speed than Taparis and uh, he does. Than, uh, Mark Chiodo that are jamming it in there very hard on the brakes and then standing the bike up and getting hard on the throttle on the way out. And Kyoto takes a very different line to the other two guys in the three-cylinder Triumph as well, doesn't he? So, um, you know, I think that's going to play out, the different lines that these bikes take. Uh, and I actually spoke to uh, Troy Herfoss yesterday when I was out there. I went out on track with him, you were there, and I said, you can't overtake from Pirelli to YMI uh, corner, can you? And he said, well, don't tell anyone, but yes, you can. <laughs> and he said, I don't want anyone to know where I'm going to plan on overtaking them. As uh, there's, there's Nick Limington's dad, Richard, holding out the, uh, the board to uh, let his son know exactly what's going on as the riders come now down through Motel Corner on the start of lap four. We've got three laps completed. Fastest man on track still, Tom Taparis, with that 16-1 set on the first flying lap. Yeah, that's a pretty impressive uh, lap there, but nice and loose down the hill he goes. Tom Taparis at Kawasaki moving around as they head into Pirelli Corner again. Chris Quinn with about that same gap, and Mason Coots caught up on the back now. He was the early championship leader, had him off on the last lap, last corner, going for a podium last time out in Darwin. Oh. And he's through. Kyoto up the inside of Tom Taparis as they came through Yamaha Motor Insurance Corner. Up to Shark now, where, where Troy Herfoss told us is one of the most important corners. Look at the corner speed that uh, most, uh, that uh, Mark Kyoto was actually able to carry through that corner on that occasion. And yep. uh, the drive, as you can see there, Steve, as you pointed out last time, they're completely different lines. Well, we've got an issue there with one of the guys. Uh, can't see the number on that R6, but it uh, looks like there's some problem. Here we go, he's, uh, Marcus has lined it up, he's come a little bit wide, nipped up the inside there in YMI and uh, left uh, Tom Taparis, uh, uh, took the gap, not much Tom could do about that and he's carried his corner speed up to the next turn and uh, got a good drive down the straight.
Well, as they come across the start finish line to complete five laps. Here we go, fastest man on track out of that top group last time was in fact Ted Collins with a 16.5 with Taparis and Kyoto both into the 16.6. So Ted Collins continues to lead as they come past our commentary position and head down towards Pirelli corner. Kyoto has a bit of a look up the inside, can't quite get up there. It's, oh, Taparis sliding the bike in sideways down into Pirelli corner. The thing is, uh, well, the other thing that we need to consider is that this track has been resurfaced. Uh, it's a very aggressive track now. Um, which means it, it affects the tyres differently. Sam Condon must have uh, had a bit of a mistake on the last lap because he dropped back to a, a mid-17 and you can see he's lost uh, touch with that group now ahead of him. So uh, still putting in a great ride here though, as we said, uh, on board the, uh, the Bike Biz Swan Insurance Machine. Nick Quinn still got Nick Limington for company though, uh, sort of one of the younger riders in the field and one oh, of the uh, elder riders in the field. Aiden Hayes. Yeah, that's a big move there from Aiden Hayes on, on uh, Mick Heffern, the, uh, the Northern Territory. And Aiden Hayes, foot off the foot peg as well on the exit of that corner. Uh, he is pushing extremely hard. And uh, is that uh, Patrick Lee behind him on board bike number oh, 29? Oh, there's Brian Houghton there as well. Um, it is Patrick yeah. Lee and Brian Houghton on board uh, bike number 17. Well, this is a pretty exciting um, stash between these guys, isn't it? Uh, you'd think this was the lead of the race that they were going for. Well, as far as they're concerned, it is. There's a replay of Aiden Hayes coming down the inside of uh, Mick Heffern, but Heffern just took the inside line. He watched Aiden Hayes' foot come off the foot peg as he goes out. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> yeah. The gear lever's there somewhere. We'll find it. Oh, Tom's right onto the back of... Uh, yeah, Mark yeah. Oh, no! Marcus Kyoto's not what he needed to do. And you could see the disappointment there as he rolled over. You could almost see the groan from Mark Kyoto as he uh, lost the front end of the Triumph uh, down into uh, the Pirelli corner. Oh, you've got a feel for him. You've really got a feel for him now. It's not what he needs to do. He needed to finish second or third in that race. It was, it was definitely doable. Well, hopefully um, there's not too much damage to the bike and actually well, can get it going again. He knows the pressure's coming. He's he, tipped in, knee on the ground, just lost the front, perhaps carrying too much front brake to the corner of the, of the circuit. But I know one of the things he's been complaining about, front end feel, and um, that's a classical front end feel type of crash that is. So, yeah, because um, he was a fair way into the corner too before he yeah. actually lost that front end. There's uh, just a couple of laps going now. Looks like Aiden Hayes has got the pace, but um, he just needs to string it together. He's still fairly new to the Kawasaki. Remember, he's also a rookie. And also good to see Patrick Lee. Patrick actually qualified in 18th position. He is now racing for a top 10 position. So uh, good performance there from Patrick Lee. As we see Cambridge Olivier battling with uh, Link Gilding, the former Australian Moto3 champion. They're actually battling for 8th and 9th position inside the top 10 as Aiden Hayes has managed to get past Mick Hefferin as well again to uh, take up the running in 10th position just behind this uh, battle as they make their way up across to the, uh, the start finish line. On the last lap, Ted Collins still lapping in the 15s. I was going to say that. That's very impressive lap times. No one else has got into the 15s all race. Ted Collins has reeled off about five or six of them in a row. And look at that bike. Even when it's got the front wheel in the air, it looks like it's on rails. Yeah, I mean, he is just riding brilliantly. It's absolutely clicked for him now. Um, Ted Collins, you've got to say, is the man to watch out for for the future um, coming out of the 600 class. Check and flag for Ted Collins, our race winner on board the Next Gen Motorsport uh, Suzuki. Great job for him. Second place will go to Tom Taparis on board the Cube Racing Kawasaki as they come across the line. 6.7 seconds, the eventual margin of victory for Ted Collins over Tom Taparis, and he will extend his championship lead as well. Great ride from Ted Collins on the Next Gen Motorsports machine. Tom Taparis takes second. Nick Limington rounds out the podium. Chris Quinn, Mason Coote, Sam Condon, Sam Muldoon, Cambridge Olivier in eighth, Lincoln Gilding in ninth, and Aiden Hayes rounds out the top ten. Just got perfect start, it was what we wanted, and I got out in front, and then, yeah, I think Tom and Mark were going at it behind me, and I was just able to pull a little gap and, you know, run my own race, and, no, I'm really happy. The next year, motorsports team in traction control suspension have worked really hard this weekend. You know, Friday wasn't great, but no, we got there on Sunday and really looking forward to the next race today. Ted was just too strong in the end. He was just too consistent and too fast, but um, I think that was our first race run for the weekend. We've been, um, you know, struggling a little bit to, to get the bike where we needed to be. And I think after that, we've, we've learned a few things and this afternoon we can make a few changes and come out and hopefully be closer to Ted and, and try and challenge for a win. This track is just, so physical with the bumps, I knew the arm pump was going to be an issue, but luckily that just held off to the end and yeah, managed third place.
Congratulations to our top three in Modal Supersport race number one. Don't go too far away because on the other side of this break, we will check out the GP Juniors, the Yamaha R3 Cup, and of course, the ever exciting High Tech Battery Supersport 300 class. Every pathway has a beginning, and here in the Australian Superbike Championship, that start begins here in the GP Juniors class. Now, I could tell you all about it, but why would I do that when I've got these uh, young boys behind me that know a lot more than I do? So let's find out from them. Uh, my name's Max Dofer, and uh, this Yamaha is an R15. It uh, goes about 130 kilometres an hour down a hill um, when it's on flat ground it's about 120 kilometres an hour and uh, yeah, it's a good bike to ride. Uh, my name's Tristan Adamson and um, these Bridgestone Battle Axe tyres are really good starting tyres and they're quite cheap so you're not using all your money on them and uh, they can be used in multiple different types of conditions. I'm Harry Curry. Um, I got into the R15 Cup through one of my friends. Um, yeah, we've been working on Working up to it, and yeah, things are really good. Yeah. Hi, my name's Reese Williams. Um, one thing I like about this car is it's really competitive, and the uh, only way to win is really who's got the most skills and stuff. Cause all the bike and tyres are all controlled, so you can't outpower anyone. You're just gonna be able to ride, outride everyone, and it's really competitive. I tell you what. You've got to give these guys a round of applause. They know more about this class than I do, and uh, they're a joy to watch out on track. Moto G GP Juniors, what a class to start in. Time now to check out the GP Juniors. Race two of their three race program over the weekend. Joel Kelso starting from pole position. Got a good launch off the line, but it was Maxi Stofer, son of two times Australian Superbike champion Jamie Stofer, that had the early lead, but it wasn't long until Joel Kelso, the diminutive Northern Territorian, took the lead as they came down out of turn three and into Pirelli corner turn four. But it was the class act of the field so far in 2017, Tom Edwards, that was soon up battling with the lead on board bike number 71. And John Littris, also on bike number 308, has been very impressive at every round this year. Joel Kelso was in the lead, had a look behind him, but it wasn't long before these three were very close together on track. And what ensued for the rest of the race was a three-man battle with positions changing seemingly every single corner. Littris held the lead from Edwards, then it was Edwards back up the inside as they came down into Pirelli corner with Kelso right behind as well. And an impressive ride this weekend, also too from Ned Falkhead on bike number 43. He and Kelso went to the line, battling for the final place on the podium, but it was Tom Edwards that took the win over John Littras by 0 0.021 of a second. Race three was more of the same, with Kelso once again starting from pole position, getting a good jump off the line as well, and led them as they made the run down to Yamaha Motor Finance corner and got a good run through turn three and started to open up a small gap over the rest of the field. Littrus and Tom Edwards did their best to try and close him down, but the more they battled, the more Joel Kelso managed to pull away on board the Deborah Motorsports machine. Look at this battle between Littrus on 308 and Edwards on 71. It was one for the ages as they went to the line trying to decide who was going to be the last two places on the podium behind Joel Kelso, who at this stage had a four second lead over the rest of the field. Ned Falkhead on bike number 43. He wanted in on the action as well. And you can see him trying to use the slipstream to get around these three. Edwards just started to claw his way ahead, but every time he got ahead, Littrus would come back at him. At the line, it was Joel Kelso that took the win. Littrus just getting second place over Tom Edwards, but Edwards wins the round with 68 points and extends his championship lead to 55 points. Highlights now from races two and three from the Yamaha Motor Finance R3 Cup. And it was our championship leader and pole man Jack Mahaffey that got a fantastic start on board the JDS Moto Machine bike number 37 and led the field down into Pirelli Corner for the first time. They made their way out of Pirelli corner. He was already starting to build up a little bit of a lead and it was only a couple of laps until he'd moved ahead, leaving these three to have a race-long battle for the final places on the podium. Lockie Taylor led on the 151 machine as they came out of the chicane, but as they came across the straight, it was Tommy Edwards that took the lead with Hunter Ford menacingly sitting back there in fourth. Taylor once again down the inside into turn four. 
Tommy Edwards would come back at the very next corner and make his way past. He looked over his shoulder and all he saw was Hunter Ford and you know that you're going to have a battle all the way to the line when you see Hunter Ford right behind. Lockie Taylor ran wide. Edwards back into second place but it wasn't long before the 151. Machine was back up into second place and fighting hard with Hunter Ford having the best lead in the house to watch this battle unfold. Obviously, Lockie Taylor loves Pirelli corner turn four and went back down the inside of Tom Edwards on 71, who we just saw in the GP Juniors. He did so many laps at Morgan Park this weekend. He would have known exactly where every single bump was, but they couldn't catch this man. Jack Mahaffey took the win and extends his championship lead. In the battle for the podium, it was Tommy Edwards on 71 that finally got second place and Lockie Taylor in third and Hunter Ford, the top four finisher once again. Mahaffey started from pole position in race number three and Lockie Taylor also got a good start but coming through the field very, very quickly once again it was Tom Edwards. Hunter Ford up into second place early. Great early showing there too from Taylor Ralph on board the 28 machine. The local Queenslander doing a great job. She's done plenty of laps out here at Morgan Park. In fact, it was a great showing from all the girls this weekend with Sharni Pinfold showing a great turn of speed on board her Yamaha R3 as well. No, you are not looking at a carbon copy of race number one. It is race number two and the exact same thing happened with Tommy Edwards on 71, Hunter Ford on bike number 20 and Lockie Taylor on 151 battled all the way to the wire as Jack Mahaffey had cleared out into the distance. And in the setting sun, it was Tom Edwards that led them round down to Suzuki corner. Jack Mahaffey took the win, but as they came to the line, it was Tommy Edwards that took second place. Hunter Ford up onto the podium in third and Lockie Taylor had to settle for fourth. The action is now about to intensify because we're adding in the under 300s and the also very rapid KTM RC 390s for the high-tech battery super sport class. They're making their way around the circuit. Now getting ready for race number three. This class this year has been nothing short of sensational. We've got two championships, the under and over 300s, but everyone wants to take the win on the road. Oli Bayless will start from pole position. Reed Batty and Billy Van Erd join him on the front row of the grid. Great to see Brock Pearson return from injury. His first performance this year. Tom Bramage, championship leader in the over 300s, will start on position number nine. And Seth Crump making his debut this weekend. And we're in the starter's hands. Oh, great start from Oli Bayless. The revs were rising very quickly and Oli Bayless has got a cracking start, but Billy Van Erd once again gets a great start on board his KTM as well. And Oli Bayless will lead them through turn one for the first time. I think that may have even been Steve. Jack Mahaffey up into third place, is it? No, it's Reed Batty on board the BC Performance uh, Landscape Solutions machine. That was a good start for Reed Batty because he, um, he the clutch didn't work for him on the start. So um, it was good to see that he recovered very well. There's Jack Mahaffey in fourth position at the moment doing a good job. But it's Oli Bayless out front at the moment. Um, with Billy Van Erd up there as well. The KTMs always get a good start. Now let's keep an eye on Tommy Edwards and see where he comes through. He normally comes through the pack. To uh, Tom Bramich as well got a good start. He's up there in the seventh position at the moment. Yeah, it's a good start for uh, for Tom Bramich. I think he's actually gone further than what he did in uh, race number two earlier on this morning as Ollie Bayless leads them out of sharp corner. Yeah, you've got to think that uh, Tommy Bramich would be one of the guys that uh, after having crashed so early on, his tyres are going to be a lot fresher than some of the other guys. So just keep an eye out for him. He could be a wild card for the podium. And also remember too that the two leading guys in the uh, over 300 class, Jack Mahaffey and Tom Bramich, have both had a DNF here this weekend. Lachlan Eppers having a big look at the back of Billy Van Erd's machine as well as they make their way up the hill now through the Yamaha chicane for the first time. Yeah, this is probably the best start of the weekend for Lachlan Eppes as well. He's uh, right on the back of the leading pack at the moment, uh, and he's used to this uh, tight competition, having this sort of racing every weekend over in Europe. Well, down into turn one. Oh, Oli Bayless, I thought, uh, with Mahaffey that was going to be going up the inside there, but uh, couldn't quite get his way through, and Reed Batty maintained second position. Mahaffey looks like he's trying to go around the outside as they run wide on the exit of uh, turn three, right out to the ripple strip using all of the track and then some Batty now into the lead. That Reed Batty on the uh, landscape supplies, the PC Performance Junior Team machine. Oh, Ollie Bayless, Steve. How far off the circuit was he there? Yeah, it was right out there, but uh, these guys, you would think it's the last lap, not the second lap, but Reed Batty at the moment is the man out the front setting the pace. There's Billy Van Erd, and you've got to keep an eye on Max Croker. Can he come through? But that vision of Billy Van Erd when he was going around Whoa. the corner, it almost looked like there was no one riding that motorcycle. Bayless is pushing that uh, thing to the limit. The front end was on the bump stop through the bumps uh, out of Shark Corner there. He's got uh, back himself back into the lead, but look who has hit the lead now, Billy Van Erd. He didn't race too. He didn't stay there till the end, though.
at all. I think all of these guys had had a chance of uh, leading uh, one of these races so far this weekend. That's, in fact, the only guy in that lead group there that uh, hasn't had a chance at uh, leading the race is uh, Lachlan Epis, and he's brought Zach Levy along with him as well, and right behind Zach Levy is Steve Martin. <laughs> so he's already passed about nine guys. He's put himself up in seventh position. So Tommy Edwards, though, got a lot of work to do this time around because there's a, a whole bunch of uh, really angry guys in front of him that uh, go to, this is their last week race of the weekend. And the fastest man on the first flying lap was Tom Edwards in seventh position, 0.7 of a second behind the race lead. So yes. our top, top seven all covered by 0.7 of a second. Billy Van Erd up the inside. Reed Batty, second position. Ollie Bayless. His dad chewing his fingernails. Yep, no point looking over your shoulder yet, boys. They're, everyone's there. Was that Brock Pearson having a big look over his shoulder as well? He's sitting back behind Tom Edwards in uh, eighth position as well. Oh, Billy Van Erd runs wide. Really wide. Lucky to get away with that. Uh, drops back through the pack. You know who the real sneaker is at the moment? Is uh, Zach Levy on board bike number 87, the Puma RV's machine. He is up into fourth place, just making his way very quietly through the pack. And uh, of course, he is the champion in the R3 Cup from last year. He knows how to ride one of these motorcycles. I'm seeing a lot of sneakers out there at the moment, mate. I just cannot tell you who's going to do that when you've got guys like that they are going to go around the outside. What a move by Reed Batty on Ollie Bayless there. I thought Oli Bartis was going to have a sneaky move back up the inside there, but he just couldn't quite get in because Reed Batty was so fast into the corner. What a great debut for Reed Batty on board the BC Performance Junior Team uh, Landscape Supplies bike here this weekend. A bit of a change from his privateer team that he's been running with all year. Look at that. Who pulling out the slipstream is that? Was that Billy Van Erd? It, I'm pretty sure it was. Or is it Jack Mahaffey? It's Jack Mahaffey it's that's Jack taking Mahaffey. the lead. Oh, the JDS Moto Man is uh, now into the lead ahead of Ollie Bayless. Where is Billy Van Erd? There he is in fourth place on board the KTM. Let's have a look at this replay now of the clinical move by Ollie Bayless to take the lead through the very important sharp corner. It didn't last very long though because Billy Van Erd came back very, very quickly, got around the inside, but then in the next corner got in way too hot lost the back end, was lucky to gather the bike up and only dropped back a couple of positions and that allowed Reed Batty on board the 33 machine to once again take the lead. It didn't last long though, Batty not long later was back to third position as Jack Mahaffey took the lead. Back to live action now and Billy Van Erd comes back down the inside of Mahaffey to once again take up the running at the front of the field. Look at uh, that man Billy Van Erd, he's, uh, he's not going to let a little crash in the last race worry him is he? Oh he is so spectacular to watch is Billy the way he just gets right off the motorcycle and uh, I think he needs some uh, elbow scrapers on board those leathers for the way he gets the elbow down coming through the corners. Look at the style there, he's such a community man, he just gets right off the side of the motorcycle. How old is Billy Van Erd? 14? Uh, 13 or 14, yeah. yeah it's incredible isn't it? So somebody that young has got that much skill in the so Up the inside goes. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's getting your uh, door shut well and truly in your face there. Jack Mahaffey <laughs> just looked and said, what the hell was that? Well, it worked because he went around the outside of him while Jack was looking to try and figure things out. Tommy oh, Edwards ain't waiting for you, though. Know for a second um, opinion there. No, he doesn't need a second invitation. There he goes, tries to go down the inside of Billy. He seems to have so much confidence, Steve, in the front end of that uh, Yamaha R3 that he can just seem to put it anywhere on track that he needs to at the moment. And it's obviously riding the bumps incredibly well. Oh, all out of shape going into YMI. Yeah, he certainly is. I mean, you've got to say both of these guys, um, Tommy Edwards riding the 150 as well, but also Jack Mahaffey doing both classes, the R3 class as well. It sort of puts it into perspective how well Billy Van Erd's done. All he can race is the, um, you know, with the KTM being the RC390, is the, the super sport race. So Billy Van Erd, probably the less track time out of the top three this weekend. That might be a good thing. That's who might be wearing themselves <laughs> out. Actually, no, as they come down towards the bottom of the circuit, the one that looks the most vigorous is probably the man in second place. Tommy Edwards, and all he does actually, I think, is ride motorcycles. Every time I see a post from him on social media, he's doing something with a motorcycle. As they come up towards the Yamaha chicane now, he's still the KTM RC390 that leads, as we said, running a new suspension package this weekend of KTEC suspension and uh, doing a great job with it as well. I, would, I never would, the way that Tommy Edwards rides that boat. Jack Mahaffey up the inside. What a move. He obviously didn't understand uh, Tommy's sick field signal of to stay <laughs> behind me.
No, well, you know, this, he likes it when there's no one in front. Jack Mahaffey has got a lot to prove this weekend. Uh, oh, oh, was oh. that nearly a, a bit of a Liberace treatment there for uh, Tommy Edwards as he nearly went into the back of Jack Mahaffey? He was carrying that much corner speed. While these three have been disputing the uh, positions at the front of the field, there's Brock Pearson has a look over his shoulder once again right on cue. He is the uh, Fabian Ferre of Australian racing. He is the Fabian Ferre of Australian racing. And you know what? Fabian Ferre is pretty damn fast. And Brock Pearson is... Is, uh, incredibly fast. There he goes again. He needs to spend more time looking forward than looking back. Yeah, he, he might have like a, a, a window wiper motor in his head the way he's going there because um, he needs to concentrate on what's happening ahead. But uh, what a return to racing for Brock Pearson. He's uh, been out for a long time. He's in the top four already. It's uh, just a phenomenal ride by him to be anywhere near the top three. They're coming around to put a lap on someone already is this lead group currently led by Tom Edwards as they make their way up the hill now. Jack Mahaffey in second. Look at the drive of the KTM out of Suzuki corner and up towards the chicane. Keegan Pickering is about to get her second haircut of the weekend as they come across the hump and into the start-finish area now. They're going to get Keegan Pickering Ooh. right about turn one. Yeah. If you want to get well and truly out of the way, otherwise uh, she might uh, wonder what the hell is happening to her. Oh, around oh, the outside. Around Tommy every Edwards. side. Oh, oh Mahaffey's on Mahaffey. the circuit. Oh, yeah, Mahaffey's. That's the end of Mahaffey's race, unfortunately for him. Keegan Pickering came out of that OK, but uh, Mahaffey didn't. But, uh, wow. It's so tight at that part of this circuit that uh, not much you could do there. Brock Pearson, look out for the rider on bike number 14 now as he makes his way up in the third position. His foot just came off the foot peg there, but uh, no bother. You've got one foot on, the other one off, doesn't matter. Well, remember, he's done a couple of years of racing overseas and his pace is uh, unbelievable. His pace is unbelievable considering he's come back from significant injuries. This is his first race moving back and uh, actually thought that he'd torn his bicep yesterday when he ran off the circuit and tried to control the motorcycle across the grass. And uh, to come back and do what he's done in this race, or this weekend, well, is unbelievable. He's on for a podium at the moment. It's going to be difficult for him, but we're in exactly the same situation we were before. Billy Van Erd is leading the race at the moment. He's coming up through turn 10. And this next corner was where he braked and got knocked off last time. Is Tommy Edwards going to try and dive up the inside this time? Or is Billy Van Erd going to close it off? He has. Oh, great line there through Billy Van Erd. He's got the drive out of the corner as well, but here comes Tom Edwards. He's won more than one race on the line this weekend, but this weekend, I think it's all about Billy Van Erd. He takes the win in high-tech battery super sport race number three. And what a victory it was for Billy Van Erd, his second of the weekend. And wow, what a class. What fantastic racing. Congratulations to not only our race winners and podium getters, but everyone in this class. It is unbelievable racing. And uh, Brock Pearson does get on the podium in third place as well. Ollie Bayless will take fourth position ahead of Zach Levy in fifth. Reed Batty in sixth place. Max Croker in seventh. Lockie Taylor in eighth. Tom Bramish in ninth. And Brandon Demery rounds out the top ten. So stoked from after last race. was pretty disappointed, so... To win the last race, yeah, I'm stoked. It was a real fun race with the boys and it's good to see Brock back up here. After round five, Tom Bramich still leads the high-tech batteries over 300 Supersport class, but now only 4.5 points ahead of Billy Van Erd with Brandon Demery only two points further behind. Zach Levy and Tom Edwards round out the top five. Under 300 Supersport sees Reed Batty maintain an impressive championship lead on 310 points from Yanni Shaw on 225, with Drew Sells closing in from behind now on 223. Ollie Bayless on 214 and Laura Brown round out the top five. Well, the action continues here at Morgan Park. Coming up after this break, race two for the Motul Supersport category. We've got some big personalities up and down the paddock, so I thought, why not get a little bit more personal with our riders? I've asked a few of them five questions each. Let's see what their responses are. Superstitions are right boot, right glove first. Yeah, I always touch wood twice. Touch wood, touch wood. Well, I've always said if, uh, if your socks don't match your undies, you're kidding yourself. So it's always uh, something I make sure that I've got, I've got on point. Nah, not really. I guess I like to think I have my lucky underwear, but it's really just the ones that are in the best condition at the time that keep getting a run, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not really. About the only thing I do is the left glove first. That's about it. <laughs> 
For me, yes. Um, I used to always wear the same socks. Uh, that was my, my main thing, really. <laughs> I would take my key group of friends, Troy, Brian, Josh, Glenn, the boys basically. Uh, my girlfriend. Oh, she's here. <laughs> probably my teammate. Kyle's pretty good value. Probably my brother Brody. I'd probably take my teammate Herfoss. He'd, um, yeah, we probably wouldn't have much of a holiday. We'd probably ride our bush bikes every day. I mean, Crumpy going pretty good. Brian's a Perth boy. I've spent a bit of time with him back home, so get along alright. Maybe have a good, good uh, bit of laugh together, I reckon. Ah, uh, me. Ah, uh, it's got to be Wayne Maxwell, doesn't it? Wayne Maxwell gives me a laugh every now and then. He's a funny guy. Funniest to look at, probably Maxwell. Wayne is pretty funny when he's when we're out. I'd be very surprised if there wasn't a unanimous decision there that uh, that Wayne Maxwell is the funniest in the paddock. Ah, uh, Jennifer Aniston. Maybe Calvin, my team manager. Maybe Jessica Alba. Um, I probably can't say I have one anymore, but when I was a kid, Jennifer Love Hewitt. Oh, I was always um, Kylie Minogue. Star crush. Well, I don't think I've gone. Uh, I don't know. Emma not a Francesco. Yeah, she's yeah, but she's really arrogant. I was I was into her until I met her. Uh, Joker and the Thief by Wolf Mother. Uh, anything Nirvana will get me in the mood. Probably a bit of System of the Down, Toxicity or something like that. I don't do music. <laughs> I don't have one either, but to, for the sake of answering the question, let's say Rocky Music. I haven't got one. I'm pretty boring. Probably Hanson and Bop. <laughs> <laughs>
and Maple Australian Super Sport race number two is underway. Great start from Mike Kyoto and uh, Ted Collins, as always, got a great start. But I think it's Tom Tapares that could be in the lead as they go through turn one for the first time. No, it's Chris Quinn, the uh, the Northern uh, New South Welshman is uh, into the lead on board bike number 82 and leads them through turn three for the first time. Yeah, what a great start by Chris Quinn. He's, uh, we talked about him earlier today. He's uh, one of the, the elder statesmen of the class, but he certainly knows how to ride. Look at that though, Marcus Chiodo straight to the front in the same corner that he crashed on earlier today. Now that's bravery. <laughs> As I said, as the camera pans around, let's hope that Marcus is not lying on the ground, but there he is on board the Repsol Triumph out in front on board bike number 12. I think he knows that Ted Collins probably didn't get the best run through turn one and turn two. He's sitting back in fourth position and uh, he's going to have to try and find his way through a little bit of traffic. And he's got Mason Coop right behind uh, as Ted Collins as well. One thing I did notice, uh, our podium man who finished third last time out, Nick Limonson, got a terrible start. He's in 11th place, uh, back in the pack, and there he is in the middle of your screen right now. Yeah, he's got uh, a little bit of work to do to uh, try and recreate that performance from uh, this morning's race one there. Oh, I think he was trying to get up the inside there. Nick Limington on board by number 27, but it is Kyoto. Look at the lead. He's managed to stretch out over Quinn over these first uh, half a lap as they come through the Yamaha chicane for the first time and up over to complete the first lap of the race. It's Mark Kyoto that leads by about uh, half a second over uh, Chris Quinn on board bike number 82, the uh, Holmes Extractive Resources Yamaha R6. Well, you've got to say that for Marcus Kyoto now, it's not about the championship anymore. That's probably going to go to that man right there, Ted Collins. But Marcus Kyoto needs to win, win, win. And uh, there's no point finishing second for him. He's got to learn from the front and learn from his mistakes. So uh, you've got to say he's going to have the bit between the teeth in this one. Oh! That Mason Coop was almost out of the seat there on the arc machine as he came out of, uh, what was that? That was YMI corner, I think it was. Oh, no, actually, no, Pirelli corner and made his way through that uh, fast left-hand kick on the way to YMI. So uh, Mason Coop lucky to keep the arc machine on track. He's trying to track down Tom Paparazzi oh. on board the Cube Racing Machine, bike number seven, but he's just ahead of him. But look at this battle between Chris Quinn and uh, Ted Collins at the moment. They are really pushing extremely hard. Bikes moving around all over the place, too. I just saw Ted Collins' machine move more than I've seen it all weekend. It had the hippy hippy shake out of the sharp corner just before. Looks like Sam Muldoon's well placed on board bike number 70 as well. Look sitting at in that. fifth position. Collins has threw up the inside through the Yamaha chicane. What a great move. He is on a mission today. I think he saw that uh, Mark Yato was starting to get away a little bit at the, uh, the front there, and it was desperate times to try and get past Chris Quinn. Not an easy task for uh, anyone to try and get past the most experienced rider. As we said, not only in the super sport uh, class, but probably one of the most experienced in the whole ASBK paddock. Yeah, and in, in Chris's case, experience means really fast. He's uh, one of the fastest guys out there for sure. But uh, Ted Collins has managed to pull a bit of a gap on him now. Mason Coote, the early championship leader, has uh, moved himself nice into fourth position. And it looks like Sam Muldoon just behind him, uh, the first uh, Kawasaki. Where is Tom Tobias? He was uh, on the podium last time out. I reckon he's going back through the pack. We've yep. had a problem for Tom. I didn't see what happened. We'll find out soon. Looked like he was there as they went through uh, Pirelli corner on that uh, last lap. So I'm not sure what's happened to uh, Tom Tobias. We'll keep an eye on the field and try and find out what has happened to the uh, the cube racing rider there's link gilding on board bike number 71 just ahead of jordan carlson on 45 a couple of queenslanders they've actually been struggling at their home venue here this weekend they're starting to queue up now behind chris quinn mason coop and sam muldoon have zeroed in on uh, bike number 82. yeah mason coop now definitely um sitting in behind on his uh arrk yamaha r6 trying to find a way past. Yeah, I thought he was trying to get down the inside there, but I think he may have been at the same time been trying to hold out uh, Sam Muldoon, who, as you can see there, is uh, getting on the throttle pretty hard, had the back end of the uh, Muldoon motorcycles, Kawasaki ZX6, starting to uh, move around a little bit there. New paint job for him this weekend. He actually works as a spray painter, so he's been working extremely hard uh, on his uh, race panels as well as on the cars at Canola <laughs> Smash Repairs. Yeah, well, he's uh, doing a good job because it's a very striking bike. It looks really good, that uh, Kawasaki, the Muldoon Kawasaki there. Good job on him. Designed it all himself, too. Did he? told me, too, uh, Steve. So great job there from uh, Sam Muldoon. Let's go down to the, the pits and an update from Luke. Thanks very much, Phil. I'm here with Wayne Hepburn. Wayne, how was the start there for Tom? Well, he got away OK, but something must have happened in turn one because he dropped back to uh, fourth. It's made it hard for himself, but he's getting through OK. Um, he's up to second and he's out after Mark Well, they've just flown by there. It looks like he's catching him. Yeah, look, he's, he's, 
just got to find his rhythm and it looks like he's doing that. So, look, he's in a, a bit of an awkward position at the moment. He's got a good championship lead. So, we I mean, know Mark's quite fast around here and aggressive. So, how much of a risk he's prepared to take? Well, it's up, up to him. Thanks very much, Wayne. Phil, Steve, back to you. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, uh, the man on the number five machine there, Ted Collins, has uh, just dipped into the 15s, which was where he was last time out. That was 0.3 quicker than the man before him. Yeah, I think it looks... Oh, no, it looks like Marchiato's down. No. Whereabouts has that happened? That's at Yamaha Motorcycle Insurance Corner. That's uh, That's got to be a high side that far out of the corner too. He's uh, lost the rear end there. You can see the big mark. He's wide. He's come in wide. He's fully leaned over on the gas, really wide, big high side, and bang, he's down. Yeah, that's a big crash too for Mark. He's, uh, he's hit the ground pretty hard there. It looks like he might have got a bit of a headbutt from the uh, the Repsol Triumph as well. Yeah. I, you know, the thing is, though, is like he's on a super quick learning curve. Yeah, well, Ted Collins, all he had to do was just uh, circulate around and see what happened, and uh, he's now taken the lead. Well, He's got yeah. a 1.8 second lead over Chris Quinn and Mason Coote that are uh, battling it out for second place. But we saw this morning, it was the back end of the race where Ted Collins was fastest. Absolutely. I mean, Ted uh, seems to take a while to just let everything settle in, not get too silly in the early laps of the race. Uh, and then he does those uh, super fast laps for the speeds. He was the only guy in the 15s. Uh, he did five or six of them in a row. Uh, everyone else was in the 16s. I think he set the new lap record as well last time out. So, yeah, it took uh, 1.1 seconds off the old lap yeah. record. We heard from Wayne Hepburn. He is in a tricky situation. He's got such a lead in the championship at the moment that uh, you just don't want to do anything silly. You don't want to be known as the guy that loses the championship because you do something silly was such a big lead. But also uh, coming into this uh, round as well, he had a 50-odd point lead, or nearly 50-point lead over Tom Tapares, who, uh, as we've seen, has uh, gone all the way back in the field. He's back in the pit, so he's scored no, uh, scoring no points in this race either, Steve. So, uh, yeah, uh, Ted Collins at the moment, uh, he's just uh, going to extend that championship lead. Uh, you see Mason Coote, who sits third in the championship, currently in a, uh, a battle for the uh, podium position with Chris Quinn, and uh, also Sam Muldoon, who looks to have just dropped back a fraction from the, uh, the battle between the two R6 riders, Quinn on 82 and uh, Mason Coote on 53. Yeah, it looks like he has dropped back. Um, and, you know, that's probably part of the do with this new track surface. I mean, the grip now with seven laps out of 14 gone, the grip of these, uh, the new grip that the tyres give has sort of gone away now. So now it's like they're working on the setup that they've done through practice, um, you know, because the tyres and everything will be sliding around. And that's where all the little fine adjustments uh, keep that speed up. Oh, Quinn runs wide and Coot is up the inside. Quinn. Oh, didn't take it, didn't need a second invitation there, did that Mason Coot? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, Chris definitely won't give up, but uh, Mason was right on the back wheel of him. I'd take my hat off to Mason Coot, though, because he has worked his way through. Um, he didn't come here and he wasn't uh, too happy on Friday, but uh, all throughout qualifying and uh, he's uh, done a good job and put himself uh, in a really good position. Regaining points that, uh, are going to help him perhaps not win the championship this year because that looks like it's going to be Ted Collins, but uh, definitely be in the top three. In fact, on the last lap, Ted Collins and Mason Coote recorded exactly the same lap times down to look the at Chris Quinn. Look second. at Chris Quinn. He's going up the inside. He's up the inside. Quinn is through. Well, there's a bit of experience for you. The most experienced man in the field just dives down the inside of Mason Coote on the last lap. It's Still not got a over few yet, to go, though. Oh, this is exactly what happened to Mason Coote and Darwin. What's he going to do? Is he going to be happy with third, <laughs> or is he going to have another go? <laughs> Oh, I almost can't look at it, Steve, as they come up towards Shark Corner now. Let's hope it doesn't bite these two when they get through safely. They're up the wrong, the long run down through High Tech Batteries in Kawasaki Corner now. He's not Can Mason up. Coote get up the inside as they come into Suzuki? He's, He's setting it look. up. No, it's, it's going to be, he's either going to have to do it into the next one into, turn, into Suzuki corner here, which he's not going to do. That just leaves the chicane. I think that Chris Quinn could have this covered, but look at the speed he's carried out of there. He's gone through. I thought Chris Quinn got it a bit wrong on the entry. He broke too late and too deep into Suzuki corner, and Mason Coot has taken full advantage with great corner speed, great drive, and a great victory for Ted Collins. Second place will be Mason Coot. Great ride there from Mason Coot. 3.1 seconds behind our race victor, Ted Collins. I don't know if you saw that, but just as Ted a bit Collins, of a wobble as he was waving as to the crowd, he took his hand off the handlebar and the, the front wheel folded about uh, 10, 20 metres from the line. So he got lucky there, did well, Ted Collins. He wouldn't want to crash uh, that close to the line because <laughs> you actually have to be attached to your motorcycle to cross the line. Yeah, well, he would have been hanging on pretty tightly as he slid <laughs> over, I can tell you. That's his sixth victory for the year. So we're uh, completion of round five, and he is uh, more than 50% win ratio for season 2017 in the Motor Supersport category.
He has been impressive in 2017. Ted Collins, he takes the win over Mason Coote and Chris Quinn. Sam Muldoon, Sam Condon in position number five. Nick Limington in sixth. Link Gilding in seventh. Brian Horton in eighth. Jordan Carlson and Cambridge Olivier round out the top ten. I didn't get off to as good a start as I would have liked and what I did in the first race, but you know, I worked my way through them and got, got out in front and I think I pulled a little bit of a gap, but you know, the boys behind me were, had a good pace, so I was having, struggling to keep in front of them, but no, I'm really happy. The next year Motorsports and Traction Control Suspension team have just done awesome all weekend, you know. From the bike we had first thing Friday to what we ended up with in those races is unbelievable. I can't thank them enough. They've just put in all the hard work and I just got, get to go out there and have fun. Quinny sort of gave it to me in the end there. Um, we both were, were absolutely on the limit and fortunately I was able to capitalise on that last little mistake he made, but to be up here on the podium, it's been, been a long time. Uh, we haven't been up here since round two. Uh, credit to the boys in the pits, you know, they've put together an amazing package. Uh, I've never raced here before, so it really goes to show what, what they've done for me and, and what we're going to achieve. That race, it was working well, I had a good pace and everything. Then Mason got past, I made a mistake over the back and then um, I was trying to set him up for move in the end, which I made, and then yeah, I just got in too hot in the last one and went sideways and I couldn't pull her up enough. Ted Collins extends his championship lead now on 232 points, 164 to Mason Coote in second place, and Tom Taparis, 156, the DNF in race two, very costly here for the Goulburn man. Sam Condon in fourth place, Nick Limington in fifth, and Jordan Carlson rounds out our top six. The final Superbike race from round five of the Yamaha Motor Finance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul Pirelli from Morgan Park is coming up after this break. He had a great round in Darwin, a very impressive test result. And in this sport, well, it is all about timing. Troy Baelish certainly recognised Corey Turner's talent. And now the Queenslander finds himself on that Desmo Ducati seat for the rest of 2017. Obviously, with, with Cal out with his injury, uh, we needed somebody on the bike. And we had a bit of a talk um, a couple of weeks ago and actually my name came up without me hopping on the bike. And I'm so glad that uh, we didn't make that decision and we, we'd already spoke a little bit about Corey and um, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a hard call. Like uh, Corey was here riding his own private bike and he's been doing well and, and you know, struggling, doing the hard yards and we needed someone on our bike. So, so Corey had a ride um, at the Southern Downs race uh, a few weeks ago then done the ASBK test here and he actually uh, loved the bike pretty much instantaneously and uh, he did he did well and, and he just looks like a real goer and a real trier he seems like a good young kid and uh, like I said he's done the hard yard so it's great to have him on board and it seems to be uh, taking good shape really happy with how things are going today in the desert sports squad. It's always hard being a privateer especially when you get to pay for things yourself it's just me and dad uh, we've been doing it for the last three or four years together so Oh yeah, it's a weight off the shoulders, not only for me, but the rest of the family as well. Um, and yeah, I can't thank Ben Henry and Troy Bayless enough for the opportunity to ride Desmond Sport Ducati. Uh, you can't put a price tag on what Troy Bayless can give to you. Um, anything we need, any direction we need to head in, uh, he's always there to give you a hand. And uh, he always knows what's good and bad, and, and yeah, always puts us in the right direction. The team's really good. They don't have too many expectations either, which I think is uh, good as well. Like, it's not a very stressful situation, which um, is always a positive for the mind, I think. Um, so yeah, we'll just keep plotting along and do our thing and see where we end up at the end, I guess. There's a few here today, but all my mates are coming out tomorrow, so it'll be even bigger tomorrow. So hopefully, I oh, yeah, do have a fair big of a, a fan base coming out. So yeah, it is really good to be at home for sure. You know, I'd love to see the bike up on the podium. And uh, I think, you know, there's a possibility of that even happening here this weekend, if all things go to plan. But, you know, we want to take it step by step. And uh, Corey feels better on the bike every time that he hops on. And we want to try and work a little bit uh, together to make him feel even more at home on it, but he certainly he looks good on the bike. When I see him on the bike, he's sort of he's sort of uh, aggressive and he sort of wrestles the bike and uh, makes me smile when I see him on it. Well, it really does seem like the perfect partnership. We wish Corey Turner the very best of luck with his new seat for 2017. Riders are on the grid for the final race of this weekend for the YMI Superbike class. 
And Troy Herfoss, starting out of position number two, knows that he left here last year with a points deficit and went on to win the championship. One man looking to continue his form from last round is two-time champion Josh Waters. He's with Emma. Thanks, Phil. Just with Josh Waters. And Josh, I know that you were disappointed yesterday with the qualifying position and you look disappointed after race number three. But there's one thing I know about you, you can get a great start. Yeah, I, I got a great start um, in the first race, so I'll try and do the same. Um, my pace at the start of the race was really good. It's just mid to the end of the race, I struggled a bit. So we've made some changes, try our hardest and um, see how we go. And I've got to congratulate you on a top 10 result at Suzuka. Obviously, any additional time on the bike is great. Yeah, it was awesome. A lot warmer than here at the moment. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was really good to, to race against a lot of top riders throughout the world. Good luck. Thanks, Eats. Troy, talk us through what happened in race one there. Yeah, just a mistake on my behalf. Um, lap four or five there. I noticed crew was starting to, you know, overshoot a few corners trying to follow Josh's wheel. And um, he'd run wide in the hairpin prior to where I, I, fought, I fell. And um, I just sort of, I just showed my wheel on the right-hand side not to make a pass just in case he'd run wide again. And um, yeah, I, I just closed the corner too much in the angle when I let off the brakes, I was asking too much and, um, and tucked the front. So just, it was bad luck and it was my fault, but um, yeah, the bike's not damaged and I'm not damaged. So, and you know, we're still in this. We're very fortunate. Well, uh, unfortunate for you and the team and your supporters, but great for the spectators because that means there's only four points now separating the top four riders, which still includes yourself. Well, I'm glad you guys are happy, but no, yeah. Like I, I said to the, myself in, in, um, and Sean in the debrief, you know, after two wins here last year, we were still further behind in the championship than we are now. So, like I said, things are, are still okay. It was just a minor mistake. I think I've had four crashes in a, a superbike race in my career, uh, so over eight years. So, it was bad luck, and um, and it was my mistake. And it's easy to fix them mistakes when you know why they happen. So, looking forward to race two. And it's very gusty out here this afternoon. So, a bit different conditions than we used to. He may have had four crashes in Superbike races, but that was his first in ASBK history since he stepped up to the Superbike class after winning the Supersport Championship. And I'm sure that Troy Herfoss will have his eyes focused on the prize. That man has certainly got his eyes on the prize this weekend. He'll start from pole position once again, Crew Halliday. He's getting last words of encouragement there from his crew chief, Chucker. And they're getting ready to set off on their warm-up lap with this impressive field of riders and an impressive Morgan Park venue. Crew Halliday will start from pole position with Troy Herfoss and Josh Waters joining him on the front row of the grid. Brian Starring, Corey Turner and Daniel Fowles on road two. Impressive debut from Corey Turner as he fills in for Callum Spriggs who has had a long-term shoulder injury operated on and he's here this weekend to spectate. Wayne Maxwell will start out of position number seven. Can he repeat his performance from race number one? Robbie Bugden and Matt Walters will also start on row three with Bo Beaton, Glenn Allerton. Al Phyllis rounds out row four on board his privateer Yamaha and great to see his dad Robbie Phyllis in the pits here this weekend. Sloan Frost the Kiwi, Mitch Levy and Troy Gunther will start from row five with row six made up of Michael Blair, Ryan Yanko and Adam Senior with Ashley Fleming rounding out the field on his Aprilia RSV4. In the starter's hands, revs rise, and we're racing. Crew Halliday has got a lightning start out of pole position. Josh Waters has also got a good start, and he goes past Troy Herfoss as they stream towards turn one, but it is Crew Halliday that leads. And is that uh, Troy Herfoss up into second place, or is it Brian Starling? Yeah, it's hard to tell at this point. Uh, it's Starring. Starring it looks like Herfoss is in fourth at the moment, and uh, Josh Waters in third. So uh, nice, clean start as they head down at a Pirelli corner for the first time. And Crew maintains it into Pirelli. Good start by him. Wayne Maxwell has got a decent start, but he has still got a fair bit of work to do because he's got some very rapid customers ahead of him. Oh, was that a bit of a coming together there between Daniel Falzon and Corey Turner? Corey Turner had to sit up and ran from the inside of the track right towards the outside. I thought he was heading off the track there at one stage, but he's managed to gather it all up and got his composure back. And Wayne Maxwell may have even had to get out of the throttle of traction there uh, early on in this race. Yeah, I, I mean, like, it's always going to be very hectic on the first lap around here. Brian Starring, let's remember, he didn't finish first one, race one. He was on for a podium, but then something went away with his uh, new SP2 machine. But it's looking good now for him. 
Well, Josh Ford is carrying a lot of lean angle, a lot of speed through the uh, Suzuki corner as they drive their way back up the hill. That camera shot doesn't actually show oh, you how steep is. Someone has gone down or run off the circuit there. Oh, it's Matt Walters has gone down on board the Rover coach's machine. He won't be picking up any passengers and he'll be heading straight back to the pits. Not the weekend he wanted, but uh, look at Brian Starr in there. He's still sticking into that uh, second position, which is uh, good to see. So as they stream out of turn three, it is still Crew Halliday on bike number 65, the i oh! Falzon has gone down, looked like he locked the front end, going into Pirelli corner, and he has gone down hard, has Daniel Falzon, the Caterpillar Yamaha, Bat. has dug a trench through the uh, the outfield on the outside of two. That looked like some sort of mechanical... Oh, that Bo Beaton down looks like as well on board the... Uh, is it Bo Beaton? Yeah, that's yes, Bo Beaton down. Unfortunately, his the race's edge, Panigale, has gone down. Is oh, there's there's someone one else? There's got to be something on the circuit. That looks like Brian Starring. Brian Starring, it looked like down on board the Crank Protein Honda. He's oh, that, yeah, right, it is too. There's, there's Corey, Corey Turner. Turner. So I'm not sure what's happened there, but we've had three or four riders go down, all within the space of a couple of uh, corners. Yeah, let's hope that they can get all that cleared up. Uh, the green flag is out as a head-on through Halliday, though. No problems for him. He still leads up front. Uh. Steve, is that an indication of how hard everyone was pushing early on in this race? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's imperative. They don't want to let those front guys get away. This is uh, Daniel Fowles on. Oh, I still just didn't quite get enough to see what that is. Definitely some sort of front end lock. But it looked problem. like he, he hadn't uh, tipped the bike in. He actually stood the bike back up. Right, here's Brian Starring. This is Starring. Starring's gone and hit the bumps and lost the front. So that's definitely uh, oh, his problem there. And a bit of damage to the brand new Honda SB2 there. Yep. Oh, the front end looked like it got very messed up there. Yep. And here we go. Here's Bo Beaton coming into the corner, foot out. Just tries to tip into the corner oh, and just lost the front end as well. Yeah. Over the bumps as well, wasn't it? Yeah, he just he just he lost it nice and early there. Perhaps didn't let that Bridgestone tire warm up um, enough. Um, so you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of blood running out there, and a few guys have gone down in the first lap. But that has given the front three guys now, Herfoss, uh, Halliday, and uh, Waters a bit of breathing space. A 13.722. How does that relate to the fastest lap? A 13.5, I think 13 it was. 13.5 is the lap record. The, yeah. uh, the new lap record set in uh, race number one. So uh, they're only two tenths of a second off the uh, the lap record on the first flying lap of this race. What we need to do is see where Wayne Maxwell is actually. It's 1.8 back. So we need to keep a, a, a look at the gap to Wayne Maxwell because he was in a similar situation in race one and he, he ploughed through the field. So. Uh, there is Wayne, he's got a lot of work to do. He, uh, he is only 1.8 seconds behind, but most importantly for Wayne, oh! he hasn't got anyone in front of him apart from these Herfoss. two and Herfoss. How did he save that? Only Troy let's, Herfoss and his lawn will his, know how close that his, was. Let's hope his brake pads aren't not bad. Look at that though, he's gone through <laughs> that and still gone up the inside. My well, goodness. There's the answer if his brake pads have been pushed back or not. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like thankfully. straight back on the brakes into Pirelli corner was Troy Herfoss. And I think that just shows the determination from the reigning Australian Superbike champion of how keen he is to get back up the front and fight for this race victory with Troy Halliday. It, it's not just a victory now. Every point is for the championship. We've only got four races left, Phil. Look, he's, he's ch on the change of direction. He's lost oh. it. Um, the front's locked on him. Um, and just slipped on a cold tyre. It's regained its grip, and uh, his heart is beating bigger than it was a couple of seconds ago at that point right there, Phil. Whew, that was so, uh, so, so lucky. So, so lucky. But you know what? These guys are that professional that uh, that will not bother him. Well, obviously, it took him about three milliseconds for it to get out of his mind because then he made that big move on Waters back into the Pirelli corner, which was the very next corner. It's still Crew Halliday that leads from Troy Herfos. Josh Waters, look at Maxwell, fastest man on track on the last lap, a 13-4. That's a new lap record for Wayne Maxwell. Halliday has now got a crank protein Honda, a Suzuki X-Star machine, and a factory Yamaha sitting on the very diminutive ducktail of the, his uh, privateer Yamaha. Maxwell down the inside of Waters, up into third position. A clinical move there from the Wayne train. Yeah, great move there by Wayne. He's, uh, he, to me, he's riding exactly uh, like he is when he's at his best. He's doing everything right. The only thing he's not doing right is uh, getting the starts um, as good as some of the other guys. They're good starts, but not as good as some of the other guys. But he's got the pace to see it through. He knows he's got the time. He knows he's got uh, a, a, a long way back. Let's head down to Luke with a quick update. Yeah, thanks, boys. I've just been chatting with Daniel Falzon's team. Uh, he's all right. They still are unsure what happened, but right or OK. Well, that's good news. Thanks very much, Luke. As we see, it looks like Troy Gunther and Sloan Frost had had a coming together. Uh, I think that was at Pirelli Corner as well. And it uh, looks like those two are out of the race. 
Let's hope that they're uh, both uninjured as our leaders make their way up and across the start finish line to complete six laps of the 16 lap journey. And it is uh, Halliday that leads by 0.1 of a second. So there's oh. only 0.4 of a second now between our top four. And uh, this will be a great opportunity too to have a look at the different riding styles. And you might be able to pick up how Wayne Maxwell actually uses less lean angle than a lot of the other riders. Yeah. This and uh, as he comes into the corners, as uh, Herfoss goes into the lead, Halliday is back to second place. Maxwell is still in third place and Josh Ward is in fourth. And uh, coming in quickly from behind, actually, is Corey Turner. Corey Turner on the last lap was one of the fastest men on track with a, uh, a 1.13.8. The only other man in the 13s was Wayne Maxwell. Yeah, we can't write off Corey Turner, can we? He's uh, definitely on a mission this weekend. And, and similarly, uh, he uses the harder rear tyre compared to everybody else. So from this point in the race, he should make his way through it. And you can see who's right with him. Robbie Bugden on board the Dunlop shot Kawasaki. Yeah. There's a bit of a wild card to bring into the mix as well. The uh, the soul bike running on uh, on uh, Bugden goes through. Oh, oh, Bugden went up the inside of Corey Turner, lost the front, and he has crashed out at Suzuki Corner. That is a big crash for Robbie Bugden. I think he's got up and he's A-OK, -okay, but the bike, maybe not so much. No, that was uh, a brave attempt up the inside, but that uh, he was asking just a little bit too much from the front Dunlop. Here he goes, up the inside, nice and tight, needs more lean angle, hits a bump, the front folds on him, and unfortunately he's just in for the ride now. Um, it, for him, it's a ride, but unfortunately that bike uh, is going to spend some time in the panel shop. Yeah, I think uh, Kelvin and the BC Performance guys might have a little bit of work to do. Might even need a new set of forks and triple clamps there by the look of the damage. Yep. But uh, Herfoss now leads Halliday in this war of attrition in uh, Yamaha Motorcycle Insurance Superbike race number two, powered by Modul Pirelli. And it is the... Uh, Ranked Protein Honda that leads at the moment from Crew Holiday's Privateer Yamaha and then Wayne Maxwell's Factory Yamaha and Josh Waters' uh, Team Suzuki X-Star Machine. And look at Corey Turner coming in very fast from behind now. And Glenn Allerton is actually up to sixth position. Good points for Glenn Allerton. That is a fabulous ride by Glenn Allerton. He's uh, obviously um, hurting big time in this race, but if he can bring it home in sixth position, he's on his way back to full fitness. Two words spring to mind when you mention uh, Glenn Allerton in this ride. Grit and determination. Nice words, Phil. So down into turn one on lap nine. It is Herfoss still leading. There is uh, 0.6 of a second between our top four, but uh, I think the timing is irrelevant at the moment because coming in very quickly from behind is Corey Turner. Still, still lapping in the 13s, Corey Turner. Big slide there from um, Prue Halliday, and Maxwell is going up the inside. Just couldn't quite get up the inside. Drew just let the brakes off when he saw the factory Yamaha coming up the inside. And the more these guys start to battle over second, third and fourth position, the more Herfoss can get away. And Corey Turner is right with them now, Steve. Yeah, I mean, what did Corey do last time around? He 13-9. Did... Oh, yeah, he's, uh, he's there, isn't he? Look at that. He's right on the back of the group. Um, and we know what he's like. He's aggressive. That Panigale drives off of his uh, short corners very well. Well, I mentioned in the first race that he was uh, he was being aggressive and uh, he's doing it again in race number two. Well, if he's going to win this one, he's got to pass four of the hardest guys in the business. Well, so we've got uh, a whole lot of blue bikes in the middle of, uh, of a gaggle of bikes led by a red bike and a fluoro orange one coming in quickly from behind. Yeah, it's a great uh, job by Corey Turner. His uh, confidence is uh, running high after the podium last time out. Uh, he nearly won his first Australian Superbike race, and he's only a couple of seconds away from winning this one. Well, as they come across the line, Corey Turner just said his fastest lap of the race at 13.694. That is only two tenths of a second off the fastest lap in this race, and he's doing it on lap 10. Which maybe is that hard rear tyre starting to come into its own. Which happens to be the lap record, I might point out. So, uh, Corey Turner is on lap record pace. 13.4 to 13.6, that is incredible stuff. That's actually a second, under, like Corey Turner's lap, was a, is a second under the old lap record before we came here. There this goes weekend. Turner, up the inside. Oh, Biffy Bargy, yes, there's someone there. Well, do you see Josh Waters had the casual look over his shoulder and go, hang on, there's a Panigale up the inside. Oh, look at the drive he's got. Corey Turner's got great drive, he's got up the inside. Not quite, okay, couldn't right. quite get it done. Waters is managing to hold him out. But look how much it slowed both of them up as the lead three have just started to get away a fraction. Herfoss pushing hard. Maxwell trying to rein him in. Maxwell's moved through into second position in the kerfuffle. Let's get down to Emma and a quick update from the pits. Just with Calvin Riley from BC Performance. Calvin, did you see what happened with Robbie? Yeah, it looks like he uh, just lost a front uh, into turn 10, just overtaking Corey Turner. 
It's a shame, obviously, because we're going to lose some big points to the other championship rivals, uh, but this is racing and these boys are pushing hard. There's some, uh, there's some close fault racing out there, so I'm a bit disappointed, but um, I haven't spoken to Rob yet, so he better tell us exactly what happened. Tough luck. Thanks, Kevin. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Kelvin. Great to hear from uh, the BC Performance team. Halliday up into uh, second place, getting up the inside of Wayne Maxwell. You mentioned that uh, Wayne wants it badly. I think Crew might want it pretty badly as well. Everyone out there has got their different reasons for wanting it, and I guess you've got to think that um, that uh, Halliday, you know, let's face it, last year he was a factory rider, now he's a privateer. He wants to beat the factory bike more than anything. Down through high-tech batteries, the uh, high-speed freight train goes. Corey Turner is starting to close in on the back now as well. So Josh Waters and Corey Turner, who dropped back only one lap ago, are now both back into this battle for the lead. It is still Herfoss leading from Halliday, Maxwell, Waters and Corey Turner. Coming up through the Yamaha chicane, Crew Halliday is looking ominous right behind our championship uh, world number one at the moment. But uh, will he be as they leave here this weekend? Stay there goes Crew Halliday. He's gone around the outside <laughs> of Troy Herfoss. Oh, that is an audacious manoeuvre from Crew Halliday. Yeah, what a move. I mean, uh, he got brilliant drive out of the last turn and uh, just slipstreamed the Honda and uh, got himself back in the lead. And he's running almost the fastest laps of the race at the moment. So a great move by him. But Corey Turner, fast fastest man again on track that last time round. Yeah, uh, Crew Halliday had dipped into the 13s for the first time in a few laps there, and you can see the drive that he set up when I said he was looking ominous coming out of that Yamaha chicane. The drive just speared him past because there's no real opportunity for a slipstream there. The no. straight is so short. They're all pushing past the limit now. And, uh, well, the big question is, as they come round to complete lap 13 with only a couple of laps to go, is, is everyone going to make it to the finish? Because the pace here is really starting to heat up now. Look at Halliday. Halliday's got a gap now. He's pulled a gap out on the on the uh, rest of the guys. Look at that. Goes across the finish Point line. Four. Point four for a second. 13.520. That is only fractionally wow. off the, uh, oh, the new lap record set in this race. In fact, I think it's faster than the fastest lap in race number one, which was a new lap record for Troy Herfoss. It's, it's certainly Crew Halliday's fastest lap of the weekend, I would say. 13.5. That's a, an excellent uh, race lap time. Not qualifying, but race lap time. He is three. giving that rear Dunlop tyre an absolute caning now as they're on lap 14 of 16 through the Yamaha Motorcycle Insurance corner and down into the uh, the very tricky section. This corner comes right back on itself. I'll tell you what I do notice though. I know oh, oh! Corey Turner! He's gone down. Corey's just pushed that front to uh, Pirelli tie just that little bit too much. Unfortunately for him, it's not going to be a dream double podium. Well, can he still get the bike going? Because he's still going to get a top 10 championship, or top 10 race finish if he can get that bike up and going because he had a pretty big lead over the rest of the field. In fact, he may even still remain in fifth position if he can get it going quickly because Glenn Allison is some 15 seconds behind. Yeah, he could be lucky. Here we go. He's uh, just lost the front and uh, off the track, unfortunately. He, get, he gets back to that bike. Let's see if it all looks intact from here. Uh, handlebar still on it because he's using it to pick the bike up. He is resuming. Corey Turner is resuming. And he's in sixth position at the moment. And so. then there were four. And then there were four. Four into three doesn't go. Four into three doesn't go. And when you think about it, these guys are uh, all up there battling for the top of the championship as well. In fact, the only one of our top four in the championship coming into this race that is not in there is Robbie Bugden. What I will say, though, is I'm just looking at the moment that uh, Herfoss is really closing the corners off. I reckon he's struggling for grip at the moment, Herfoss. He's uh, cutting in. Um, he's uh, standing the bike up early. It looks like he's struggling a little bit for grip, perhaps compared to... Uh, through Halliday out in front, and uh, Wayne Maxwell looks like he's ready to strike. He wants some of this. Well, you can see Wayne there was carrying a lot more corner speed than Troy Herfoss through one of those corners, but Wayne Maxwell is a demon on the brakes. Couldn't quite get past through it. Suzuki corner, the corner that claimed Robbie Bugden and his BC performance, Kawasaki. Maxwell closes up into the chicane. He goes through Wayne Maxwell. He's up into second place as they come round to start the last lap. Now, Maxwell is up into second place. Herfoss is in third. What can Josh Waters do? Has he got an answer? Has he got a reply? Look at that, right up the inside, not much room there. About uh, five centimetres, thank you very much. That's enough for me, that's enough for Wayne Maxwell. You only need the width of a front wheel to get it through. And he and got uh, the drive up the hill too. 
a 13.568. That was Crew Halliday's third lap in the 13s at the end of this race in a row. So uh, he is on fire in the latter stages of this race with those uh, setup changes made to the uh, iPhone Yamaha this weekend. Crew Halliday could be on track to take his first victory of 2017. It's and not, he's got a handy lead over Wayne Maxwell. It's not over yet, though, because Josh Ward is sitting in fourth position at the moment. He's just seen what Wayne Maxwell did, and he's thinking, you know what, I think I can do that. Oh, I just see Maxwell's front end bouncing up and down like he was on a motocross track as he came through Kawasaki Corner. They're heading down towards Suzuki now. Has the Suzuki got an answer? In fact, no, her boss has closed up onto the back of Maxwell as they came in there. I don't think Waters is close enough to put a Maxwell-esque manoeuvre on at the Yamaha chicane. No, not but this Crew time. Halliday is out of the corner. He is heading for victory. His first of 2017. Crew Halliday takes the win, celebrates in style. Maxwell takes second. Her boss comes back with third and... Uh, Josh Waters will take fourth position. Where does Corey Turner finish? How many points does he get? And can he maintain his uh, lead in the rookie championship? <laughs> what a ride for Drew Halliday. He deserved that uh, pole man. He wins here the second race. I've seen him ride like that before. He did it at Winton uh, last year. And, um, I mean, he's done it again here. On his day, he's, uh, he's fast. They've made some changes to that bike, Phil. And you know what? I think they're going to benefit him for the rest of the year. Glenn Allerton gets through to finish in fifth position. Mitch Levy takes sixth position after being absolutely nowhere in practice and qualifying early on this weekend. So Mitch Levy on the Bridgestone shot. Privateer Yamaha in sixth position. A big weekend for Yamaha this weekend. Congratulations to Crew Halliday. First pole position of the year yesterday. First race win of the year today from Wayne Maxwell, Troy Herfoss, Josh Waters, Glenn Allerton, Mitch Levy, as we said, in sixth position. Al Phillips in seventh. Corey Turner in eighth after remounting in the, after that crash. Michael Blair and Ryan Yanko round out the top ten. Couldn't have thanked the guys. I own Yamaha, YMI, YMF, uh, Star Mining, Win Homes, 100%. Uh, Velocipede, Evoc, Power Bar, all the guys that have been on board with me from the start. Big thanks to them. Massive thanks to my dad, you know. He's worked endless hours in my garage and, you know, I don't help him enough. I've got no idea what to do. He just does it all and, you know, and I wouldn't be here without him. So I've got to thank mum and dad a lot for this. And, uh, you know, I'd like to also thank Chaka and Sammy, Jeff Rowe and Christy and uh, my girlfriend Mariana for coming out and supporting. It's, it's good to get a, get a win for the first time on Privacy Bike again and you know, it's, more, it's more of a family thing. So, um, no, nah, it's good. We're going to go and have a little bit of celebration and uh, try to come back to the home round Eastern Creek a bit stronger. The expectation from seventh was um, not really that high. It's a, it's a tough, tough gig, you know, but I just, you know, drew it back to basics and knew that I could just keep hitting that number. Even then, I had to ride across the gap. You just spend too much energy. These guys are riding at such a high level here. If you've got to try to just step it up and bridge that gap, spend that little bit of energy I maybe needed at the end and, um, you know, Troy made a mistake in that last lap and I was lucky to capitalise and really stoked to get second and uh, take the overall win. I was on my on my limit there and a little bit tentative in places on the track after the crash but um in saying that it was um yeah just a little bit of grip i was lacking off the edge of the tire and um but we done what we could we just got got beaten fair and square so great job for sean and glenn and, and the whole team to get the bike back into great working order and and um it's nice to step right back into things and the championships as we were now we just keep carrying on and we're in it in it to win it Championship points after round five sees Wayne Maxwell leaving Morgan Park in the championship lead. Five points ahead of Troy Herfoss with Robbie Bugden still in third despite the crash in race two. Daniel Falzon in fourth and Josh Waters in fifth. The championship position has changed incredibly after what has been a hectic weekend here at Morgan Park. It has indeed, Phil. Thank you very much to you, to Steve, to Luke Heismans as well for joining us this weekend. Some absolutely fantastic racing. And not too far away. We don't have too long a break. We want to see you in Sydney, Eastern Creek. I'm Emma Francesco. Thank you very much for joining us here in Morgan Park, Queensland. We'll see you very shortly. And in the meantime, to stay up to date with everything ASBK, make sure you go to asbk.com.au. Good night.